Good morning, everybody. Uh, very warm welcome here from the Center for Global Studies and welcome to Eloise Decoste's presentation today. Um, I'm very, uh, we are very fortunate to have Eloise now in the hallways of CFGS. Um, I will introduce her in a second, but before we do this, uh, let me start this session by acknowledging with respect to the Kwang peoples on whose traditional territory the University of Victoria stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Bassanish peoples, whose traditional relationship with the land continues to this day. And um, if you looked at what Eloise is going to present today, you realize how central you know, this land acknowledgement is to the reflection that Eloise will provide from a legal perspective, um, the uh, ownership of land, issues of reparation and reconciliation. So um, with this talk today, we will address head on you know, the, the legacy of the First Nations here in our territory and what this means in the contemporary legal political world. With this, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Eloise de Coste, um, as I said, who's now a real visiting graduate student uh, and um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau scholar at the Center for Global Studies. Um, Eloise is now physically in Victoria. Um, sorry, we can't provide you with the kind of community we normally are, but you know, if you've listened to the president of the university, we might be gradually uh, on our way back to being a real center with a real community on site. But you know, with this now the, the more virtual welcome uh, to Eloise uh, for joining us um, here in Victoria at the Center for Global Studies. Um, as you can see here, Eloise has a distinguished already academic career, but also a great degree of experience in the legal world, in community engagement, and in advocacy. Um, as, um, Eloise received her BA in environmental studies and political science, and a BA in, uh, in biogeo law from McGill University. The, she then went on to do an MA in international law um, at the Geneva Academy of International Humanities, Humanitarian Laws and Human Rights. And, you know, this set her onto a path also to, to work um, in this field. She acts act as a law and policy analyst for Femme Autochtone du Québec as a grassroots indigenous women's organization where she has represented also um, various uh, cases domestically and internationally. Um, and you can see here, and I think we will get a better sense of her, the focus of her PhD and her fundamental research uh, question is to think critically through what reconciliation means in terms of and looking through the prism of international human rights and going back to some of the core ideas of transitional justice um, and uh, reparation as a core element of this. So, Eloise, you know, um, with welcoming you to the center, you know, and also more formally, it's a real pleasure um, of having you from the center, actually, from our premise to present today uh, on your ongoing research and your presentation for today is entitled Sex-Based Discrimination and the Indian Act, Time for Reparations. The floor is all yours, Elise. Thank you so much, Oliver, and thank you for the center for having me. Although these times are a bit strange, it's been great to be part of this community and to be out here in Victoria. Um, so before I start, I also want to express my gratitude to the Esquimalt, the Songhees, and the Saanich Nations for receiving me on the ancestral territory of the Likwagan people. I feel very, very lucky to be able to spend these few months here. Um, I also want to acknowledge the wonderful women of Femme Autochtone du Québec, a grassroots association of Indigenous women um, from all First Nations in Quebec that works actively to defend and promote the rights of Indigenous women across our province. And I've been collaborating with this organization for the past two years now, or a bit more than that. And I know a lot of the knowledge I will share today uh, from this work and from the women who have shared with me their experiences and their perspective on the issue. So as Oliver just mentioned, my, my PhD research focuses on the idea of reconciliation between settler colonial state and indigenous people. My goal is to delineate the contours and elucidate the legal content of the notion of reconciliation. For this purpose, I work mainly from the principle and praxis of emerging from international human rights law and transitional justice. More specifically, I seek to theorize the notion of reconciliation as a legal concept in order to demonstrate that reparation is sine qua non to reconciliation in settler colonial states. 
So my presentation today will focus on Canada's legal obligation to provide reparations for historic and contemporary violations of Indigenous women's rights. And more specifically, I look at reparations for the gender-based discrimination in the Indian Act. First, I'll provide an overview of the issue, discussing both the, the discriminatory provision of the Act and the legal challenging and resulting modification that had occurred since 19, the 1970s. I'll ask you to bear with me, this section might be a bit long and a bit legally tedious, but it's very important to fully grasp the issue. I'll then uh, discuss Canada's obligation to provide reparation from the perspective of international human rights law, presenting both the nature and the content of the, the, this obligation, and then assessing what Canada has done on the issue of gender-based discrimination in light of those international standards. Uh, my presentation is based on an article that I'm currently elaborating for my doctoral is, exam. So it's a work in progress and I will look forward to your reactions, comments and suggestions. Uh, before I start, I wanted to say a quick word about language. So throughout this presentation, I will use the term Indian. Um, I apologize in advance for the discomfort that might cause. Unfortunately, this is still a, a relevant legal category under Canadian law today, and is thus strictly in the legal sense that I'm using this term. So in order to, to understand today's state of affairs and to fully appreciate how gender-based discrimination was an integral part of the Indian Act for 150 years, and more largely of the settler colonial project, um, we need to go back to the pre-confederation pre period and work our way to the present day. So the first policy aimed at the gradual removal of all legal distinction between Indians and settler um, aimed at absorbing the Indian people into the colonial society was known as enfranchisement. So it was first introduced into law prior to Confederation by the province of Canada with the adoption of the Gradual Civilization Act in 1857, which provided for the possibility to give us to give up one's legal status as an Indian in exchange for individual possession of reserve land um, upon the fulfillment of certain criteria of civilization, which evidently were defined by colonial value. This was voluntary, but strictly for men over 21 years old. So a man's wife and children were automatically enfranchised with him, regardless of their wishes and without receiving a share of reserve land like him. So if enfranchisement both sought to reduce the number of Indian and to gradually extinguish reserve land. And the provision on enfranchisement remained in Canadian law throughout numerous legislative amendments until 1985. Um, and throughout this whole period, the wives and children had no say. So um, in 1867, it's what we know as the birth of the nation of Canada, but it also marked a drastic change in the constitutional relationship with indigenous people. So according to the British North American Act, so the, the, the Constitution of the Dominion of Canada, um, Indians and land reserved to Indian fell under the exclusive legislative authority of Parliament. This is still a, a valid today and a very relevant feature of Can Canada's constitutional makeup. So, this new relationship was decided unilaterally and without discussion or consultation with Indigenous people on their future position within the Federation. Moreover, Canada's goal was clear, um, as claimed to Parliament by then Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald. It was to assimilate and make essentially disappear Indian people. So two years after um, this new constitution, Oh, sorry, I went forward. Wow. Okay, so um, Parliament adopted the what's now the known the Gradual Enfranchisement Act. So the goal was to um, the formal adoption of the assimilation policy into Canadian law. Um, so this new act continued the policy of enfranchisement. But it's important to understand that this policy had actually been a failure from the perspective of the, the colonial, colonial state because 
since the adoption of the 1857 Act, only one person choose, well, one man choose to voluntarily enfranchise. So, the, so in 1869, a whole new policy was added. And this policy stated that an Indian woman who married a non-Indian man would lose her status and her band membership, and so would any children from that marriage. Um, this was the state of the law until 18, 1985. But the reverse scenario did not happen. So the men who married out, they maintained their status and the, the, the women acquired it through marriage. So it's really important to remember when we discuss the idea of Indian status under Canadian law, that this is a, a legal category that was created by the federal state and developed within the administrative framework intended to manage and assimilate indigenous people into settler society. It's important thus to distinguish it from the wider notion of identity and having indigenous ancestry and a relationship to a First Nation. Um, also, this unequal treatment of Indian men and women under the Act must be understood both as an expression of the pat patriarchal values of the settler state back then, but also as, as part of its assimilationist ambition. In other words, not only were women deemed inferior and immense shadowed by this at this time in history, but they were also perceived by the colonial state as a threat to the colonial project. So this brings us to the infamous and still enforced Indian Act. Um, in 1876, the, the first version of the Indian Act was adopted. Um, so there's a lot that could be said about the Indian Act and the dif different iteration throughout history and the many ways it's, it's sought and it's still seeking today in some regards to dispossess indigenous nations of their land, their sovereignty, their kinship, their identities, their culture, their languages, their tradition. But for the purpose of today's discussion, we'll focus exclusively on uh, the provision pertaining to status. So the, fir the, the first adoption of the act was in, was in effect, a consolidation of the separate pieces of colonial legislation aimed at Indigenous people, and it was intended to bring all Indigenous nations with whom the Crown had distinct relationship under one act, and thus one relationship that was both homogenizing and deeply paternalistic. Over the year, the act was amended numerous times, and very brutal policies were included at different times in history, including the banning of cultural practices, the mandatory attendance in residential school, the creation of the pass system and the permit system, just to name a few. But one central aspect of the Indian Act since the beginning has been the definition of who is an Indian. Um, and the, in 1876, sorry, the definition adopted in Section 3 clearly stated that an Indian, for the purpose of status, is a man, is children, and any woman legally married to him. So the, the married policy for women was maintained, um, and so women who married stat men without status lost their Indian status, but the reverse wasn't true. The compulsory enfranchisement provisions were also added. So in some cases, men who, for example, graduated from university, acceded to certain profession or joined the, the armed forces would automatically lose their status because they were being civilized and so were their wives and kids. So the provision on compulsory enfranchisement and the rel related criteria were modified over the year, but the underlying logic remained until the 1960s. The, um, the Indian Act was significantly revised in 1951, and uh, very important changes were made with regards to uh, status. So the main modification then was the creation of the registration system. So up to then, federal officials would keep records of band membership, treaty distribution list, and so on in various records. The creation of the Indian Register enabled a centralized record of 
those entitled to registration and thus to receive federal benefit as Indian. So for the first time, all um, people who had status were kept on one in one record. The introduction of the registration system further restricted the admissibility of women. So upon marriage to non-Indian, women would no, not only lose status, but they would also be enfranchised. And this was new. Prior to 1950, 51, women who lost status through marriage could still retain some link to their community to the insurance by some in Indian agency of informal ID cards known as red ticket, which enables some of these women to maintain a relationship to their band and to be able to continue living on reserve. So prior to 1951, there was still a the legal status of these women were kind of still a bit unclear, but after 1951, it became very clear that they were no longer Indian and they were no longer part of their community. And in effect, in 1956, the red ticket women were actually paid a lump sum money and were put in the same legal position as the married the women who married out after 1951. Um, so. In addition to the marry out rule, a few other changes were made in 1951 um, to accelerate essentially the process of the gradual disappearance of Indian. So the double mother rule was introduced and it essentially stipulated that at 21 years old, if both your mother and your grandmother had obtained status through marriage, the child as well would lose status. Um, another kind of another interesting and a bit disturbing element of the 1951 legislation was that a male child born outside of marriage to an Indian father would be registered, but his sister, so a, a, a female child born outside of marriage, would 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 not. Um, so. It didn't take very long for women to finally mobilize and start demanding um, change. And so in the 1970s, indigenous women took the issue in court. First, in 1971, Jeanette Corbiel-Laval, an Ojibwe woman, member of the Wik Wik Mekong Mem Band on Manitoulin Island, who had lost her status upon marriage, alleged that the subsection under which she lost her status violated the 1960 Canadian Bill of Rights on the ground of discrimination by reason of sex. So we have to remember that this is before the Canadian Charter. The, the trial judge actually rejected her claim, but she won an appeal. Meanwhile, Yvonne Bedard from the Six Nations Reserve, who had lost her status through marriage in 1964, and when she separated from her husband and sought to return to live on the reserve with her children, in a house she inherited from her mother, um, she needed the band council permission to live on the reserve as she was no longer a member of the community since she had lost her status. And the band council gave her one year to dispose of the property and ordered that she leave the reserve thereafter. So fearing eviction, she brought a legal action against the band and arguing along the same grounds as uh, Corbiere Lavelle. And she won in trial the judge actually concluded that the entire act might be inoperative because of violation of the Canadian Bill of Rights. Um, both cases were joined and brought before the, an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. And in 1974, the court ruled in a divided decision. So nine if, of the nine judges, five judges found that the, the Indian Act was not contrary to the Bill of Rights. And essentially, and kind of, kind of disturbingly, they concluded that what the Bill of Rights protected was um, the, the equal, equality of treatment in the enforcement of, and application of the law. So essentially, since all um, women were, would lose status through marriage, they were all treated equally by the law and there was no discrimination. Um, 
So following this very disappointing ruling, the issue was brought internationally by Sandra Lovelace Nicholas, a Maliseet woman from the Tobique First Nation in New Brunswick, who petitioned the UN Human Rights Committee. She had lost her status through marriage, and when her marriage ended, she returned to the reserve, but she, since she was no longer registered, the Band Council refused to give her subsidized housing on the land, and she was denied access to healthcare and education for her children's services provided by the Band Council. So she alleged that Canada was contributing to, the, to its obligation pursuant to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which, had, which Canada had ratified in 1976. The UN Human Rights Committee found that the refusal to let Sandra Lovelace return to her community and belong to her band infringed upon her cultural right as guaranteed by Article 27 of the Covenant. The committee did not, however, rule on the discriminatory nature of the Indian Act, simply noting that the inequalities in the Act predated the coming into force of the Covenant in Canada. And it's important to understand that under international law, treaties do not have retroactive effect. So the following year, the, um, Canada repatriated its constitution and adopted the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom which enshrine the right to non-discrimination. However, Article 15, the equality provision, only came into force in 1985, um, and it was provided so that federal government and the provinces would have time to make the legislative uh, amendments necessary to comply with the, the equality provision. So finally, in 1985, um, sex-based discrimination was removed from the Act with the adoption of Bill C-31. Um, this bill did the following modification to the Indian Act. So first, the marrier out rule and the double, double mother rule, as well as the infringed, uh, enfranchisement provisions were removed from the Act. The women and the children who lost status through marriage as well as those affected by the double mother rule and by the enfranchisement provision were all reinstated in, in the thus regained status. Also, and very importantly, a few new provisions were included into the act. So um, the, the new, the Bill C-31 included, introduced what is now known as the second generation cutoff rule. So this rule provided that and it's still, it's still in force today. Um, there are two subsections of section six, which is the, the section that define admissibility to status. So sex, section one is for registration of those whose both parents are registered under the act. Section two is, reg is for, to, for those who only have one parent registered under the act. So if a section two has children with someone who's not registered, their children do not have entitlement to registration. So after two generations of um, children with only one parent who's registered, entitlement to registration disappears. And obviously this, this rule was, was introduced into the act in replacement of the policy of marrying out and the policy of the double mother rule and enfranchisement as a way to gradually diminish the number of Indians over generations. Um, related to that, the act included what is known as the unstated and undeclared paternity rule, which um, is now the presumption that if a child is born and doesn't have, um, the father is either unknown or not declared on the um, birth certificate, then it's presumed to be someone without status. And as you can see, in conjunction with the second generation cutoff rule, well, depending on the women's status, it might mean that the child, even though the mother has status, if she's registered under 6'2", the child will not be entitled to status. And if the mother is registered under 6'1", the child will be a 6'2". Finally, and quite importantly as well, um, section 10 and 11 provided respectively that under section 10, um, band, band council could develop their own, their own membership codes for the band, 
And under Section 11, those who opted not to do so, then the membership to the ban would remain under the control of the Indian registered and that subjected to the same rule as the Indian Act rule. So for the first time since 1951, there's a distinction between Indian status and ban membership. And for the ban who've opted to have their own membership codes, that can mean that either the membership code is wider than the status rule, and thus there are people who are members of a ban without having um, status. But the reverse is also true. There can be some ban who have adopted more restricted membership codes and so that um, some people seeking to be member of the band who have status are actually not um, able to gain membership in their band. So in sum, what Bill C-31 did was to reinstate the women who had lost status but not on an equal footing as men. Why? Well, firstly, at the time now, all those who lost status at the time of the legislative modification were entitled to remain registered um, and were registered under Section 61A. The, um, and this included the women who had acquired status through marriage and their children. The reinstated women, however, were registered under 61C. And the, those who were enfranchised were registered under 61D. So this might sound like legal technicalities, but it actually had significant repercussion in that it maintained the discriminatory effect of the law. So by virtue of the second generation cutoff rule, the women who were reinstated found themselves with a lessened ability to transmit status to their children. So um, in other words, the assimilationist goal was maintained into the act, although the explicitly gen gendered provision were replaced by apparently neutral ones, which had gendered effect. Also, the unstated and undeclared paternity, paternity rule has the effect of creating an additional burden on women, both in terms of their choice of partner and in declaring paternity, even when it's not in their best interest or in that of the child. In that case, you can think about um, abusive relationship or uh, sexual assault and so on. But why is status so important even though it's a colonial creation? Well, access to all the related government program benefits and service are contingent upon having status. Also, um, having been membership comes with a series of rights and ability to participate in one's community. Obviously, in some cases, having status doesn't guarantee having membership, but in many cases, the two kind of go together. And so this having, being a member of your band means you have political rights, including the right to vote in band election, and you have a right to live on reserve or to have some property right like inheritance, and you have access to the band services and programs, such as the school, healthcare, even have a mother tell me that um, she lived in her community and her children were not entitled to status. So they were not allowed to go see Santa at Christmas uh, because this was a service provided by the bank council. And as non-member, they were not entitled to participate in any of the activities that were funded by the bank council. So you can see that the repercussion of not having status can actually be quite, um, quite present on a daily basis in someone's life. Um, at the time of Bill C-31, and to some regard still to these days, the reinstatement of the women who married out was a very political issue. Many band council actually showed great resistance to accept the re-registered women. And this was in large part due to the fact that the sudden increase in registration was not accompanied by a proportional increase in funding and resources, including reserve lands. While First Nations community were already facing and are still facing today, se severe underfunding and overcrowding. So the added member only added, uh, increased the pressure. And this had, has created a lot of tension and stigma. And this is still felt felt to this day by the women who were reinstated and their children. Moreover, the second generation cutoff rule added to this tension and stigma 
by creating what is perceived as two categories of Indian. The six one who are enjoying full Indian status and the six two being only half Indian. And to really understand this, we have to go to um, the next court case, which was led by the lawyer and activist Sharon McIver um, and her son, Jacob Grismer, who challenged the act on the basis of the remaining inequities. Namely, that reinstated women could not pass on entitlement to status to their grandchild to the same extent as men in their position. So Sharon McIver had lost status through marriage prior to 1985 and she was reinstated following Bill C-31. Her son um, was born also before 85, and so he was registered as a 6'2". So when he had children with a non-status woman, his children were not entitled to registration. However, if Sharon McIver had been a man, um, in 1985, she would have been registered as a 6'1A, and so would her son. So her grandchildren would have been 6'2", would have been entitled to status. And the BC Court of Appeal agreed that um, this differential treatment was discriminatory and contrary to Section 15 of the Charter. So in response, um, the Canadian government adopted Bill C-3, um, but Unfortunately, the bill was tailored to the specific finding of discrimination by the court and thus nar nar narrowly focused on remedying the exact situation identified in McIver without seeking to comprehensively address all the remaining iniqu iniquities. Although it was clear and obvious that the act was still contrary to the charter. So what did Bill C3 do? They created a new subsection of um, section 61C. So 61C.1 was created for precisely the children of the women who were reinstated. However, this new category was restricted and was only, it only included children born or adopted after 1951, so the creation of the registry. And that was so because um, in doing the discrimination analysis, the whole case was argued uh, um, comparing the marry out women to the children of the double mother rule. And the double mother rule was introduced in 1951. And so the differential treatment was found on that basis. And, and the, so the bill fixed the discrimination only based on this differential treatment. Um, so it only corrected the issue up to 1951. It also created a distinction between the children born after or before 1985 when um, the act was amended and the, the sex-based discrimination was removed. And it also created a distinction between the children born outside or within marriage. So by then, you can see that um, admissibility to status under the Indian Act became quite complicated and messy. Um, also, admissibility to 61AC.1 was contingent upon having children yourself. Um, meanwhile, the, those who were enfranchised and reinst reinstated in um, 1985 did not see any change in their status because Bill C-3 only modified what related to the McIver challenge and the question of enfranchisement was not part of the McIver challenge. So it didn't take very long until the issue was brought back to court. And in 2015, the Superior Court of Quebec found once again that Section 6 was um, contrary to the Charter because it violated the equality provision. This time, the, the court was two different scenarios were brought before the court. So the Deschenel uh, case was really the next generation after the McIver case. So Stéphane Deschenaux's grandmother had lost status through marriage. So in 1985, she was reinstated as a 6-1-C. His mother um, was born without status 
and in 1985 was re-registered as a 6 uh, 62 right and in 2010 with build c3 she became a 6 1 c.1 so this meant that Deshenu himself did not have status when he was born. Um, his situation did not change in 85. And in 2010, he became a 6'2". So this meant that his children were not entitled to status, despite the two rounds of, of legislative modification. Now, if, if rather than having a grandmother who married a, a non status man, he had a, a grandfather who married a non-status woman, his children would have been entitled to registration. And the court agreed and found that this differential treatment was discriminatory. The second case that was part of the Deshaino decision was that of Susan and Tammy Yanta. So Susan was born out of marriage from an Indian father before 1985. So she, as a female child of an, as an illegitimate female child, she was not, she did not receive status at birth. She would have if she had been a male. With Bill C-31 in 1985, she became a 6'2 because she only had um, one parent with status. If she'd been a male, since she would have been registered at birth, she would have been a 6'1A. So Tammy, her daughter, did not have status, at, did not have status um, in 85 and was not entitled to status in 2010. But if Susan had been male, then um, both her daughter Tammy and her grandchildren would have been able to be registered. So here again, and the differential treatment of illegitimate children based on sex was found to be contrary to the charter. And so the, the, the Superior Court of Quebec declared that Section 6 of the charter, the, the, the status provisions of the charter, was inoperative and gave the government a certain delay to correct the act. And so the government um, adopted Bill S3 in response. Um, in 2017, but interestingly, it took uh, almost three years until um, the new bill was completely brought into force and all the modifications were done. So in the first phase of the implementation, the cousins issue, so Deshaino's case, um, the sibling issue, so the illegitimate child, male versus female, was corrected. And also a third scenario, which was that of uh, what is called the omitted minor child. So if a child was born to both a status women and a status man before 1985, but his mother remarried to a non-status man while the child was still minor, the child would lose status as well. So Bill S3 corrected that. Um, it also introduced some form of remedy for the case of unstated or unknown paternity. And what it does now um, is that it provides some form of flexibility to the Indian Register to consider various form of evidence in determining the eligibility to status um, in the case of an unknown or undeclared parent, grandparent or ancestor. So there's still a, um, a requirement to prove status, but there's a bit more of flexibility in doing so. Um, it's important to realize that this might remedy situation where people are trying to get status based on and when there's an unknown parent further up in their um, in their genealogy. But in the case of a woman who's trying to register her own child and doesn't want to declare the father, um, it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, the first phase of the implementation of Bill S3, however, did not um, change the fact that there were differentiated status. So section 1A and section 1C were, and C.1 were maintained, as well as the 1951 cutoff that was introduced in 2010. 
Then after the first phase, so in, in 2018, 2019, the government undertook what it called a collaborative process on Indian registration, then memberships at First Nations, which was essentially a nationwide consultation with First Nations on the remaining issues. And in 2019, in its report to Parliament, Parliament the government indicated that the consultation had shown general agreement for the removal of the 1951 cutoff. Consequently, in August 2019, Bill S3 was fully brought into force and the 1951 cutoff was removed and all the section um, 61C was replaced with a new 61A provision. So there was no more differentiate this status. However, the second generation cutoff rule remains in place and the undeclared and unstatus paternity issue remains, although with a lessened burden of proof. However, um, moreover, to this day, those who were um, enfranchised, particularly the women who were automatically enfranchised pursuant to their husband's decision to enfranchise, um, are still registered under 61D and um, have not had their situation corrected. So their ability to transmit status is actually still less than that of um, anyone else. Uh, including the women who married out and obviously of the men. So where does that leave us now? Well, in December 2020, the government submitted its final report to Parliament in which it stated that the provision of Section 6 of the Indian Act no longer privilege one sex or gender over another. Obviously, the women who were automatically disenfranchised might not agree. Um, the report also recognized the residual impact of this historical sex-based law and their effect. Yet, there has been no detail of what the government intends to do to address the residu residual effects of 150 years of discrimination. It's not noteworthy to mention that following the unsatisfactory um, Bill C3, so in 2010, Sharon McIver actually decided to continue her battle and she petitioned the UN Human Rights Committee. And finally, in January 2019, the committee held that the right to equality prohibits both de jure and de facto discrimination, such that to fulfill its obligation to provide reparation for the violation of McIver's right to non-discrimination, Canada must do three things. Amend the Indian Act to eliminate all form of differentiated treatment based on sex, which arguably has been done with Bill S3. Take measures to address the residual discrimination within First Nations community arising from the legal discrimination based on sex in the Indian Act and adopt guarantees of non-repetition. So this brings me to the question of reparations. The principle of responsibility stipulates that the obligation to answer to one's violation of the law means that any wrongful act causing a prejudice creates an obligation to provide reparation. This is a foundation of the law that's both at the heart of the civil and the common law system, and it's also a general principle of international law. The function of reparation is to seek to erase the consequences of the illegal act and to establish the state of affair to what it would have been if the act had not been committed. So initially, international law was interested in interstate reparation. But with the advent of the international human rights regime, the scope of the principle of reparation was extended to the prejudice caused by states to groups or individuals. So the obligation to provide reparation is stipulated in numerous international human rights treaties today, including several which have been ratified by Canada including the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. Moreover, it's generally accepted that where the right to reparation is not explicitly stated, it's nonetheless included in the right to an effective remedy. Finally, even instruments that provide neither the right to reparation nor the right to an effective remedy are still considered to comprise an obligation to provide reparation, which is implicit in the general legal obligation to respect, uphold, and apply international human rights law. This is notably the case of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms 
all sorts of discrimination against women. So in other words, it's well established by the standards of international human rights law that a violation of human rights necessarily generates an obligation to provide reparation upon the responsible state, regardless of whether this obligation is clearly stated in the relevant treaty or not. Now, what's the content of this obligation? According to the um, article on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful act, which were drafted by the International Law uh, Commission, the wrongful state has the four following obligation. Perform the duty, uh, perform the breached obligation, cease the wrongful act, provide appropriate insurances and guarantees of non-repetition, and provide full reparation for the prejudice caused. Moreover, in the case of gross violations of human rights or serious violation of international humanitarian law, the reparation must be adequate, effective, and prompt, as well as proportionate to the gravity of the violation and adapted to the circumstances. They may be individual and or collective. The measures of reparations may take the following form, restitution, compensation, satisfaction, rehabilitation and guarantees of non-repetition. And the victim must have access to justice under conditions of equality and must be able to access easily all useful information regarding the violation and the mechanism of reparation. So overall, what we must understand is that according to the standard developed under international human rights law, it's a wide interpretation of the notion of reparation that prevails. So this brings me to the challenging question of reparations for the violations of indigenous people's rights in settler colonial states. Just as mentioned a few minutes ago, by joining the international human rights regime, Canada accepted to be subjected to an obligation reparation. The difficulty with indigenous people's claim for the harm caused by colonial, colonialism is that they're often described as historical injustices. So according to this conceptualization, these injustices are generally viewed as being beyond the purview of the state's obligation to provide reparation because of the principle of non-retroactivity of treaties. In other words, although they certainly constitute serious violations of human rights law on their current standards, unlike contemporary violation, what is deemed to be historic injustices are not considered to give rise to a legal obligation, merely moral ones. Consequently, the recognition of so-called historic injustices and the implementation of reparations uh, measures remain largely viewed as dependent on political will, which to no surprise is often, very often actually lacking. However, what I'm trying to show in my work is that this characterization of indigenous people's grievances is inaccurate. In my, in my opinion, it's important to distinguish between three types of violations and their legal consequences. So while historical injustices are indeed beyond the purview of modern international human rights law regime, contemporary violation, as well as the violations that are rooted in the past, but which are ongoing, are for them part, their part subject to the obligation to provide reparation. Now, in my opinion, this distinction is crucial to make in settler colonial states precisely because of the nature and operation of settler colonialism. So for settler colonialism, the continued existence of indigenous people constitutes an ongoing challenge to the legitimacy of the settler society in its claim for land and sovereignty. Thus, the whole structure of settler colonialism operates to eliminate indigenous people. In such context, the pre prejudice caused to indigenous people must be understood as an ongoing process of multidimensional dispossession, dispossession of land, of sovereignty, of legal orders, of cultures, of identity, language, of kingship, and so on with a genocidal vocation. So this dispossession is not to be understood as strictly historic. To the contrary, it's part of the state's architecture and reproduced by the operation of its structures and practices. 
consequently characterizing indigenous people's grievances as solely historic actually ob obscures the true nature of the prejudice caused by settler colonialism and unduly restricts the scope of the obligation to provide reparation incumbent upon the Canadian states. So in this regard, I think that the case of gender-based discrimination in the Indian Act is very telling. Here's why. Um, because this discrimination was not simply an expression of patriarchal values that were dominant back then, but most importantly, it was a very intentional tool of the settler colonial project which was purposefully targeted at indigenous mothers as givers of life. And so the effect of this discrimination is still deeply felt today, both in terms of the stigmatization of the women who are reinstated and their descendant, but also more gener generally because of the devaluing of indigenous women's lives and roles within their community. And it's important to mention that numerous scholars have documented the very close relationship between this, the gender-based discrimination uh, in the Indian Act and the ongoing crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls through this process of devaluing and excluding indigenous women um, from their community. So let's now assess Canada's response um, in light of these international standards, keeping in mind the ongoing nature of the prejudice caused by the sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act. So as stated in the December 2020 report, Canada considers that, uh, that now all sex-based inequities have been removed from the law. But what about its obligation to provide reparation? Well, firstly, um, as we saw, it took 35 years and numerous court cases. I mentioned a few, but there are actually more. Plus another UN reprimand um, of Canada to f for Canada to finally eliminate the inequities in the Act. Although it knew since 1985 and probably before <laughs> that the discrimination had continued. And even though the explicit sex-based discrimination had been removed from the letters of the law. So throughout this period, this stigma against the excluded women and their children only grew and became even more rooted in First Nation communities and mine. Um, so that's not 35 years or more. That's not what could be described as prompt reparation. Secondly, to this day, the only form of reparation bestowed by Canada has been the legal restitution of status to the excluded women and their descendants on the equal basis of, as men. No other form of reparation, whether individual or collective, has been considered by the state. In light of the findings of the Human Rights uh, Committee, both in the Lovelace and the McIver cases, and given the scale of the human rights violation arising from the discrimination in the Act, it's evident that the mere restitution of status does not constitute adequate, full, and effective remedy. Thirdly, let's note that in 1981, Following Sandra Lovelace's petition, the UN Human Rights Committee blamed Canada because it considered that preventing um, Sandra Lovelace from returning to her community and to belong to her band upon her divorce was undue interference with her cultural rights. However, to date, the federal government has never approached this issue from the perspective of violations of cultural rights, which is certainly intimately linked to the settler colonial project. No measures, no measures of reparation aim at addressing and redressing the cultural harm caused to individuals and to communities and nations as a result of the discrimination against women and their exclusion from their community has either been provided, developed, or even envisaged by the states. To the contrary, actually, Canada maintained before the Human Rights Committee in the McIver case, so just a few years ago, that Canada should not be held responsible for the effects of sex-based discrimination on the social and cultural relationships within First Nation, an argument that was rejected by the UN Human Rights Committee. Fourthly, Canada has not compensated those who've been excluded from programs to which they would have been entitled if it had not been for the fact that the state maintained a discriminatory regime for decades after the 1985 amendments. Yet, for some, 
this might actually have very tangible material uh, consequences, notably for those who could not obtain the reimbursement of uninsured medical expenses to which they were entitled, which can actually represent considerable sum for those suffering from health problems uh, requiring specific care beyond what is covered by the public health insurance. And let's, remind, re let's remember here that giving all the, the brut brutality of colonial policies and the intergenerational effects, um, First Nations often find themselves it, with uh, numerous health problems. Um, so the, 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 the effect of this exclusion from programs to which they actually should have been entitled can be actually quite important in someone's life. Um, and lastly, one of the driver of the tension and discrimination within First Nations community is Canada's failures to provide adequate funding and resources, including land, to meet the growing number of, of members following the legislative amendment. And this chronic underfunding actually prevents the rehabilitation of community by keeping well alive the harm caused by the discriminatory provision. So failure to, to act here is certainly contrary to the duty to adopt guarantees of non-repetition. Obviously, the very existence of the Indian Act regime constitute in itself a violation of Indigenous people's rights to self-determination. And today, Canada actually appears eager to withdraw itself from the administration of First Nations identity, which obviously would be a welcome and necessary move forward toward reconciliation and the implementation of UNDRIP. However, seeing that Canada seems to consider the file of sex-based discrimination in the Indian Act closed, the fear is that the responsibility will be transferred to First Nation in the name of self-determination, along with a nice mess that the state will no longer feel responsible for. Worse yet, it risks creating a mythology that the injustices of the past have been resolved, when in, in effect the transfer, the transfer of responsibility might only further the consolidation of settler colonialism, rather than creating conditions conducive to decolonization. Reparation is thus crucial to truly give First Nations the chance to heal the scars caused by 150 years of discrimination and to avoid that its legacy continue to be reproduced, but without state accountability. Thank you for your attention. Um, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you so much, Eloise. You know, what a comprehensive and, 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 and very, you know, uh, competent way of describing a legacy, I think, whose, whose repercussions I haven't seen in, you know, their severity yet, you know, put forward in such a condensed way, you know, to understand we what legal status means and how it is in a way uh, scarred by gendered forms of, uh, of exclusion. And so, so thank you very much for this. It's hard to imagine that you put all this into one article, uh, but I uh, suppose it also informs your PhD research more broadly. And, you know, you can definitely see how your legal perspective really sheds light on broader issues of, of re reconciliation and a proper response by the state. So thank you very much for this. And with this, I would like to open the discussion would like to start us off. Rod. Well, if nobody else wants to <coughs> leave in, go. I'd want to second the uh, observation that that was a remarkably uh, comprehensive and understandable presentation of a really complex uh, question. I'm just amazed at the, at the way in which so much has been packaged into a really uh, articulate and understandable uh, chronology. The thing I wondered about, or, or the thing that struck me as I was listening, uh, not so much the, the legal question as, um, as the boundaries the question. I was thinking Ben Perrier would be interested in this problem of defining the boundaries of membership and, and the different issues you come into, but sort of more fundamentally, um, it seems kind of odd to be searching for non-discrimination in the process of creating um, 
boundaries around memberships, which are designed precisely to create differential identities. And there's, a, there's an interesting question. I mean, these, these memberships are uh, conferring uh, economic value in, in very different ways, depending on what group you can qualify as a member for what group. Um, there's a um, long time ago, um, Doug Hartle uh, raised that question in, in thinking about um, how you would measure social welfare and recognizing what kinds of disputes uh, are going to arise around creating memberships which carry a differential benefits and, and the, uh, the question of what extent can those boundary lines be permeable to what extent is there traffic amongst uh, the different groups. Um, I guess Charles Taylor talks about different ways of belonging as well as different ways of being. Yeah. And, and I think we're going to create, um, I guess, continuing social uh, strife around the uh, fine-grained determinations of who, who can decide who is a member of what groups. I mean, band councils have capacity to establish who's a member, uh, whether they're going to recognize the um, urban, urban members that are banned off reserve. I know there's quite a lot of tension on that issue. So just to, just to um, point out that there's, um, even beyond the question of reparations, there's some downstream uh, quite, um, quite uh, difficult issues on that question of creating, creating memberships, carrying differential benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think, at least from my work with Indigenous women, um, there is a very, um, the, 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 let's say the struggle for equality is seen as a prerequisite for moving forward to um, and moving away from any form of federal involvement in the determination of membership and to giving uh, to uh, communities or to nations really their right to self-determination, which is recognized under international law, which is at the heart of UNDRIP. Um, and so, but for the, the women who've been excluded, I think the, the, the perception is that if this is not dealt with, any move towards self-determination will actually just reproduce the colonial logic rather than moving away from it. But it has been a very, a very, very political um, creating a lot of political tension um, and the relationship, it's, it's very well known that the relationship between First Nations and the Indian Act is a complicated one, right? It's one um, that at the same time is perceived as a very fundamentally colonial and problematic, problematic piece of legislation, but at the same time, it's kind of I've heard often saying it's terrible, but it's all we've got, right? It's the only form of legal recognition that we have. Um, from I, I feel that on this, um, Indigenous women have a very different posture because they, they are perhaps less inclined to see any form of positivity coming with the Indian Act. And I think that the emergence of international, uh, of an international regime that protects Indigenous people's right actually creates a lot more of possibility of ensuring respect and recognition of the different um, legal position of indigenous peoples without having to kind of lean back on the very problematic in Indian Act. And so indige indigenous women are actually asking, well, rights for indigenous people, but also respect of our human rights. Right? That's what the, the, the fight for discrimination against discrimination has been since since the beginning and to this day. Um, but it's evident that um, the the very deep wound that was caused um, by this 150 year of discrimination will take time to heal. And at the heart of this issue is both the question of obviously who gets to decide who's a member, 
But the question of who gets to decide who's a member is very directly related to the question of resources and land. And, and you make a very powerful case for reparations in, in this particular case. But the, uh, the question of who decides who gets to be a member um, is, is interesting in a situation where the membership would carry claims on, on other people. Uh, in this case, for example, uh, membership brings you claims for the benefits that are um, uh, offered under the Indian Act uh, in, uh, in exchange for the, the original deal on sharing the land. But, um, but there are membership uh, as, a, as a registered status Indian um, does represent a claim on the Canadian treasury. And, and so the question who gets to decide on that membership becomes a bit more complicated, I guess. Um, I was interested that they, the Métis, if I understand correctly, have an interesting problem that the, uh, the Métis, most of the uh, group sees themselves as tied to the Northwest um, territory, the original territory. And they question whether the Métis in uh, the Maritimes actually have a claim to be part of the Métis Federation. Um, so, so it's an issue which could arise internally as well as externally, I guess. But anyway, thank you very much for your comments. I thought it very persuasive. Thank you. And I, I would simply add that the issue of Eastern Métis, which is actually also very strong in Quebec and very problematic in many ways, is also a product of that discrimination. Because in Quebec, at least, you hear a lot of people claiming um, Indigenous ancestry based on this idea that, oh, yes, yeah, somewhere down the line, I had this. And most of the time, it's a, it's a woman, right? This great, great, great grandmother was excluded. But there's no actual link or any recognition. And often that ancestor actually doesn't exist or, or is like seven generation beyond. So it's no link to the actual um, discrimination in the act, but it does create this mythology, which has proven to be very problematic in the, in the discussion of who gets to claim identity and who gets to you know, represent indigenous peoples on the political um, sphere. Thank you. Uh, now we have, Nicole, then Peter, and then Keith. So Nicole, you start us off. Great, thank you, Eloise. That was really interesting. And um, this question maybe shows my ignorance of, of, of law and these things, but um, I just kind of wanted to pick up on something you just spoke about in terms of the relationship of UNDRIP to the Indian Act or the potential for UNDRIP or the implementation of UNDRIP through DRIPA or at the provincial level to provide an alternative to the Indian Act because I mean I don't I was just thinking while you're presenting like why don't we just get rid of this but I understand it's not quite that simple but in terms of the potential moving forward for an international framework implemented at provincial level will that and like maybe I just don't know enough about law but would that work? Or would that be, do, do women, do Indigenous women see that as a potential for um, kind of reclaiming their, their rights? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, under, I mean, under the international law regime, it's self-determination that, and, and self-determination obviously of everything, including identity and membership, right? And so, in my opinion, and, and through my work, it seems kind of that a lot of people agree that the Indian Act's regime is not, cannot be reconciled with UNDRIP. But UNDRIP provides for the legal guarantees to, to protect Indigenous people's rights in a way that, that didn't exist um, in 1969 when uh, the, the Trudeau, back then the Trudeau government sought to just eliminate the Indian Act and put everyone like just make any legal distinction disappear. And that's, there was a very strong um, opposition by First Nations to that, right? Mm -hmm. But back then there was no other form of guarantees or recognition of the distinct legal position of indigenous people. What UNDRIP does is that it actually provides for those protection and much better protection than anything that could be in the Indian Indian Act. So um, the right to free prior and informed consent and the right to territory, uh, protection of cultural rights, 
obviously the right to self-determination, all these elements are now protected by UNDRIP and so open the way to getting rid of the Indian Act, which is very problematic, very uh, colonial and very patriarchal and moving to um, self-determination in a way that would uphold also um, human rights. So in, in the work I've done with Indigenous women, for sure, the, the move towards the implementing UNDRIP requires getting rid of the Indian Act and creates conditions that are actually conducive to do so in a way that upholds uh, Indigenous women's rights. Can I just ask one quick question that's follow up? Um, what about the kind of um, irony or maybe hypocrisy? I don't know, but the idea that, like, as I understand, UNDRIP, UNDRIP is really about self-determination. So that we don't, Indigenous communities or Indigenous peoples don't need the, the province to implement UNDRIP to realize, you know, like this reliance on the colonial state to create a mechanism which seems kind of antithetical to self-determination in the first place. Yeah, obviously. I mean, and it's important to understand, well, to remember, right, UNDRIP is an, a piece of international law and or it's, 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 a, it's a declaration, it's not a treaty, but nonetheless, it's a product of negotiation, right? And it's a product of no negotiation of the main subjects of international law, so of states, even though Indigenous people, civil society was very active in the process. Um, and it did take something like 23 years to be negotiated. So it's, 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 a, it's a, a compromise, it's not the ideal result, right? Um, and yes, I think, Obviously, just like indigenous rights protected under the charter, right, the protection in itself is not constitutive of those rights, but it's nonetheless legally important because it makes them enforceable in court. And it, it and so I like I think the argument of the danger of the politics of recognition and of relying on the states to recognize rights of indigenous people is very important. But at the same time, within kind of the working of um, of the of the state and of the legal system, having those guarantees put into law um, is kind of a necessity. In, in Quebec, we had the Atikemet actually proclaim their their sovereignty a few years back. But the reality is that you know they're still administered by the Indian Act and they're still negotiating their land uh, their land agreement and all that with the state. So there's a nice symbolism, but on a day to day basis, there's not much that has changed from that declaration. Great, thank you. Peter. Um, hi, and, and I'd like to echo the others. And it's, uh, that was a brilliant piece of analysis. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, not, uh, not entirely new, but uh, sobering nevertheless, uh, and an important focus uh, that you're, you're taking on this work. Two very quick comments and then a question. Uh, one is, uh, we should never underestimate Canada's capacity to buffer itself from international pressure or laws. Um, and secondly, I think we need to, at some point, there is, needs to be a discussion related to inherit, in hereditary governance systems within territories, and not just those which are confined by the very small, tiny spaces which are governed under the Indian Act and uh, in band councils. Um, my question is um, whether you've come across any um, instances in international jurisprudence or uh, instances where in fact this is going further down the road uh, than Canada has gone, because certainly the instances of discrimination against women has been ripe and ripe throughout the whole colonial project. And just wondering whether there are other jurisdictions where, in fact, someone may have been looked at that to be worthwhile uh, exploring or having as a comparison. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So other jurisdictions who have looked at the issue from of discrimination against women in other countries? Or? Uh, yes, yes, indigenous women, Aboriginal people, for example, in Australia and New Zealand and so forth, uh, as an example, uh, who are who have faced or are looking at exactly the same kind of dynamic that you're looking at in terms of equitable rights and uh, 
Right. Um, I, I would say per se, the, I think the Indian Act and the regime it created is actually quite unique. Um, I'm not aware of any other um, like similar process of determining identity and having a very explicit sex-based discrimination provision. But for sure, the what I've, through my work, I've been um, involved with a lot of, with advocacy, especially in Latin America with indigenous women. And you see so much parallel of the work um, and the issues that the women there are facing and the women in Canada have been facing. And that is, certainly a product of the fact that, you know, settler colonialism is deeply patriarchal as well and has affected indigenous women in very different ways. Um, and that's true for the, the entire continent. And also, I think going back to the idea, um, the, the, the Indian Act system, I didn't go into that, but did not only create status, it created ban council, right? So the ban council and the reserve system and all this is a product or of the Indian Act. And it's also deeply patriarchal and has created um, a very uh, gendered political dynamic within communities that have been reinforced by the exclusion of women from membership through the, the, the process of marrying out policy and thus have uh, reduce the political status of women. And um, what, I, what I saw in my work, women have been very critical of the bank council system and have been very critical of the table of uh, where chiefs sit together. And they say things like, um, you know, the, 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 the AFN or the, the Quebec uh, Assembly of First Nations has never been interested in the issue of missing and murdered indigenous women until there was money put on the table related to that, right? So there's really a sense, a, a, a feeling that this ex political exclusion of women has translated into a, a, um, a discourse where th the rights of women are not really at the heart of the conversation about indigenous rights and have, to, have often actually been pinned against self-determination. And so the activism of women is also to bring the concern of indigenous women and the place of indigenous women back at the center of the movement of indigenous uh, people's rights. And you can see that civil society, um, indigenous civil society, both in Canada and abroad, is largely led by women, right, who kind of stand side by side with the more political bodies that are still very male dominated. So, um, and in many regards, this is a product of that safe space discrimination. Great, thanks. Thank you. Keith. Hey, thanks so much for the talk. I really appreciated it. And I, I've got one comment and then one question. Uh, for the comment, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on Nicole's point about UNDRIP and, uh, and as you mentioned, the fact that it's negotiated by an international system that fundamentally excludes Indigenous nations as, you know, voting members territorial jurisdiction. And I just wanted to build on that point, I guess, and point out that it also presumes that, that the settler state will control the relationship unilaterally. It's a document that gets signed by settler states. Nobody asks First Nations to sign this uh, and is implemented by settler states and can be repealed by settler states. So uh, it, in the same way that the Indian Act is premised on a denial of indigenous jurisdiction and the unilateral settler sovereignty so is under it, but, and I guess I wanted to suggest that if we're looking for an alternative legal foundation for the relationship, uh, an alternative to the Indian Act, that is, we ought to look to treaty rather than to to under it because it actually recognizes indigenous jurisdiction and puts in place a multilateral framework. Uh, but I want, for my question, I wanted to pivot towards the concept of reparations, which I think is is at the heart of your talk and is a welcome contribution to the discussion for me. It's not an idea that you hear discussed uh, very often. And I, I just was wondering, uh, you know, when you, when you conceptualize reparations, what sort of atonement do you envision and who do you think it should go to? Uh, and I may have a follow-up depending on, on what you have to say. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, just re regarding to your comment, I think it's interesting because in Quebec, I think the history um, 
with treaty is, is there's no historic treaties, right? Or at least not recognized as such with, with regards to land. And then there's the James Bay Northern Quebec Treaty, which actually has obviously been very important, but has also created problem um, mainly in establishing borders, right? And how, um, so the communities that are just under the border who actually have claims to the land that have been negotiated. And so I think that um, treaties are not necessarily seen as the avenue forward in Quebec. Um, and so maybe that's why uh, there is a greater reliance on international law. I think also part of, um, part of the work I'm doing is also trying to shift the lens of Canada sees itself kind of as a provider of human rights. And so it's trying to bring back that, that perspective that actually Canada also has obligation that it's not fulfilling. And a whole other aspects of international law that's very worth going into, but I didn't address in this talk, is that beyond UNDRIP, um, there has been standard developed by the inter-American system, notably, which Canada is part of, that uphold perhaps even um, greater rights and that are not product of state negotiation, but rather the result of strategic litigation led by First Nations um, or indigenous peoples in the Americas and um, that have upheld right to, to land and right to um, free prior and informed consent and cultural rights and so on. And so I think that um, when we think about international law and how it has developed with regards to rights of indigenous people, there's actually space for a more nuanced perspective. Um, and, um, and, and at the end of the day, these standards actually are serious, obviously a, a positive move forward in terms of redefining the relationship, although it might not be um, the end of the conversation. And obviously it might not resolve the, the question of the existence of the established state in itself, right? Um, and then somehow I forget your question. <laughs> uh, uh, the question was, uh, when you talk about reparations, what sort of atonement do you conceptualize and who should it go to? Right, yeah, so um, I, I guess when I was designing this presentation, I realized that I needed to give a lot of background, just assuming that in this very international and interdisciplinary group, there might not be all the, <laughs> the necessary kind of knowledge to dive into more of the legal argument. Um, and so I, I decided not to go into uh, transitional justice, which is, which is very the, an area where the idea of reparation has been uh, developed at length and, and transitional justice is, is kind of this field that emerged in the process of transition um, to initially to democracy uh, after civil war or after dictatorship in the 1980s and 1990s, but which is today really kind of this field and this area of convergence within with different area as um, imposing mechanism to move uh, from, to, to, to deal with a troublesome past and kind of to move forward, right? And so the, the very idea of recognition as a political aspect comes from transitional justice and, um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada was, is a transitional justice mechanism in a, what the field would call a non-transitional society. And then there's all this debate about, you know, is, is decolonization a transitional process or not? But beyond that, to answer your question, um, reparation measures can, can, can take um, many form. The, the, the actual, actually the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and, and really everything that was negotiated after uh, the, the, um, the, with regards to the residential school comprise different form of reparations. Um, but I think what's important to remember is the importance of putting everything together. So yes, compensation um, is an important aspect, but so is restitution and rehabilitation and, and importantly, the guarantees of non-repetition. So the legal reforms to make sure that past harm is not reproduced. And so in, in this specific, in the case of settler, um, settler indigenous relation, I think reparation needs to be, and I think that's why, that's why I find international law interesting is that it opens the door to a very large understanding of reparation. It opens the door to collective reparations for nations as well as reparations for individuals. It opens the door to 
policies aimed at rehabilitating communities that have that are feeling uh, and so in my opinion reparation means everything from constitutional reform to create an actual space for indigenous people within the constitutional makeup of the country to um, very specific to equitable funding on reserve for for programs uh, that are designed for communities probably also you know the, the abolishment of the reserve system and replacement with but so I think reparation can also actually be a, a mechanism to decolonize and to really do away because international law does adopt and accept a very wide um, a very wide understanding of reparation that is not just what domestic courts usually do is most of the time just compensation which clearly is insufficient and often inadequate and um, and and the fact that reparation can be needs to be understood as in some instance individual but I think in the case of indigenous people mainly as collective because it's indigenous people as peoples that have been targeted by colonialism. I appreciate that thanks a lot. Kisa, some of feel the two of you could probably continue this conversation for quite some time but maybe that has to wait for another occasion. Uh, maybe one last uh, question Mehdi you know if you could Hopefully a brief question, uh, so we get close to the end. But Mary, please. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. This is far away, the farthest it could be possible from my my knowledge and my uh, my expertise and all that Canadian politics, Indigenous politics. It's it's um, and, and law. Uh, uh, so this is not really close to my knowledge. And please um, uh, forgive my ignorance in my question, but. Um, probably it goes back to the notion of belonging and and also citizenship. Um, I'm interested to learn uh, more a bit uh, the role of this discrimination and exclusion, the, signif the significance that it had um, in, in, this, in this whole process. Um, so I don't know, basically my question is that, is this exclusion, could, could be, can we, can we find a parallel for this exclusion in the citizenship model in Canada for women, uh, for women um, in the same period, or it's just uh, a mechanism or uh, um, a strategy used against indig indigenous uh, nations. I don't know if my question is uh, 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 clear, but I would appreciate if you could um, elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I, I think it's both, right? I think uh, certainly the idea that a woman's status would be determined by the man's status was clearly kind of a, the, a product of the patriarchal norms that were dominant at the time, just that, that women were considered people by the aid of the law and not have the right to vote until a certain time um, in, in Canada. But I, I think it's important to understand that there is more at play and that um, women were... Um, were also seen as a threat to the colonial project because of women's role within indigenous society. And, and that the targeting of indigenous women through this exclusion was not just a product of patriarchal, patriarchal norm, but was also very purposeful in, in uh, leading forward the project of colonization. And, um, and it's not, and the fact I think that indigenous like the white the non-indigenous wives of men of indigenous men gain status was also a way of bringing into communities non-indigenous women and and therefore the the cultural practices of the dominant society right um while at the same time excluding the indigenous women who who would be the one uh, raising the children in the culture and in the language so it so there was a very intentional attempt to transform the democratic constitution of the communities and through this process to make the, the culture and, and the languages disappear. So I would think that the, um, in some way, yes, there is a parallel to just because of, of gender, but I think there needs to be an intersectional discussion on this issue to really fully grasp both the reason why the policy, but also the consequences. And, and, the, and when I talk about this link with the issue of um, missing and murdered indigenous women and just the prevalence of vulnerability and violence against indigenous women in Canada, this is also a product of this 
very purposeful targeting of indigenous women to bring forward the project of colonization and the disappearance of indigenous peoples. Thank you so much. And also a great thank you for me, Louise. You know, like, I, I always have the feeling Ubik is the right place for you to be, but, but really having listened to you now and realizing what is happening at the, you know, the law faculty here at Ubik, you know, the, the focus on, on indigenous rights and, and reconciliation, I think, you know, hopefully you will have quite a productive time at the, at the center. And yeah, we're very fortunate to have you with your very distinguished expertise. So good luck with your article and your PhD. And, you know, we definitely look forward to seeing you in the hallways, you know, hopefully a bit more often in the very near future.